Well, whoever gave me these notes, I can't read them. <laughs> They're so small. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm here to uh, announce that uh, I will not be seeking uh, re-election to the United States Congress in 2024 and plan to leave Congress in the first week of February of 2024. Um, <clears throat> Moody's just downgraded American debt from stable to negative, citing the dysfunction of Congress and the dysfunction of, of Washington. And <clears throat> Congress is not the institution that I went to 19 years ago. It's a very different place today. We're spending more time doing less and uh, the American people aren't being served. For example, last week we <clears throat> had very late votes, multiple votes, most of whom, most of those votes of which were to reduce the salary of administration officials to a dollar. Now, <clears throat> there was a time where leadership could discern between what was serious and what was not. Unfortunately, those days are over. Um, so we're in a rough patch right now as a country. The country is deeply divided. The Economist just did a piece not long ago stating that in the midterm elections in 2022, 1. 107 million people voted for members of the House of Representatives. The difference between Democrats and Republicans was 6,670 votes. And <clears throat> that idea of crossover appeal has been you know, replaced with performative, audacious uh, behavior, which makes a mockery of the institution of Congress. And Congress is Article I of the United States Constitution for a reason, because it's the most important branch of the three in government. And the most important branch of Congress is the House of Representatives. Why? Because it's closest to the people. I didn't go to Washington 19 years ago to change the world. I went there to change my community. And I think that we have uh, in many, many ways, from downtown Buffalo to uh, the waterfronts, plural, uh, the Buffalo River, uh, the Lake Erie shoreline, the Outer Harbor, the Inner Harbor, and have promoted uh, a quality of life that has been recognized internationally and nationally. Uh, the Economist magazine, uh, Fortune magazine, uh, the, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and many other publications have done feature stories on Buffalo extolling the virtues of the new Buffalo. For the first time in 40 years, the population of young Buffalo is increasing, not decreasing. The fastest growing neighborhood in Western New York is downtown Buffalo. Young people are coming back here. Our economy is diversified. That work must continue, but it will continue without me uh, representing in this community in Congress. There's just a time uh, for change, and I think this is the time, and that's what the basis of my decision was. And I think that uh, I want to come back to the city and serve this city uh, that I've represented in Washington for the past 19 years. Uh, the people of Buffalo are genuine. Uh, they are good. They are hardworking. Uh, the one thing they want at the end of the day is just something to believe in, something to believe in. And for me, it was never about Wall Street or J Street or even Main Street. It was about the neighborhood streets where real people lived and struggle every day. And still they find some reason to believe, to get up and to go to work and to take care of their families, to take care of their communities and do the kinds of things that are necessary that we all aspire to. Uh, as individual citizens of this community. So with that, I'll take any questions you may have about specifics, Tim. Brian, if you can't tell us what you plan to do, you can tell us how you plan to serve the community, what would you like to do in your post? Well, as I said, we travel, in Congress, we travel 11 months out of the year, pretty much. And then uh, during the month of August, I would travel overseas quite extensively. So you're really gone a lot. Uh, I'll be talking about you know, what my future plans are in the, in the weeks to come. Uh, I'm still talking with people. People are reaching out about uh, inquiries of availability of recent, as recently as this week. And so I have an obligation just to assess all of them before I make a final decision. Uh, but there's a, lot of, you know, there's a lot of good to be done in this community. And I first and foremost want to enjoy this community that we have all worked so hard uh, to, to make better. 
I don't have an agreement. You have a lot of history here in yeah. Western New York, during your time in Washington. What, are there any specifics that you would like to be reflected to as you resolve Well, this is tangible stuff. I, you know, I, I think the most is the, the intangible. And I was a teacher of history and economics at Buffalo State College, and they let me teach a course, write a course, and teach it called the, uh, the Economic History of Buffalo and Western New York. And in it, we would chronicle the rise and decline of Buffalo's economy dating back to the 1901 Pan American Exposition. And Buffalo was the eighth largest economy in the nation at that time. All the great artists, Frank Lloyd Wright, Henry Hobson Richardson, uh, Richard Upjohn, Louis Sullivan, Daniel Burnham, Louise Bethune, they were architects of extraordinary talent that could have went anywhere in the world. None of them were from Buffalo, they came to Buffalo. Because this is a city that said to those creative people, you can get your vision turned into something real. Over the 20th century, uh, Buffalo lost its footing. Uh, the decline of manufacturing, uh, changing world economy. And with it, people lost confidence in their community, the collective confidence, which is so important in attracting new investment and new ideas and new energy. People used to drive around in the cars with no goal on it, uh, wide right. We had a view, an inferiority complex, that our fate was determined by external forces over which we had no control. So a lot of the flights that we took on, typically they always started with no, uh, but a lot of that was designed not only to build the physical infrastructure to make the waterfront uh, cleaner and more attractive, but it was also to rebuild the human infrastructure of the people in this community to try to get back to that period of confidence. And I think that we are there. And you look it up yourself. You know, pre-pandemic, Buffalo was the talk of the nation. Because of this, this renewed spirit, this, this youth movement, uh, this recognition that the downtown core is attractive, exciting, and vibrant. So a lot of this, yeah, there were physical improvements. Our waterfront was old, declining, and industrial, and that shaped the image of Buffalo for people from the outside. Now, at least it has a basis from, from which to be defined as youthful optimistic and hopeful. And that's what defines uh, Buffalo and Western New York. And those are the fundamentals for economic investment, economic growth, uh, and life quality. But you look around this city, this beautiful facility uh, from the 1901 Pan American Exposition, Delaware Park, the Art Gallery, all of these things are indicative uh, of a city that is on the rise. And so my hope is that we have played a small part in helping to rebuild the psychology of this community uh, as a can-do community again. Do you get involved in having anyone on Shakespeare's due diligence for Congress? No, there'll be plenty of time for that. I'll be, you know, I'll be in Congress for several months still. We have a lot of work to finish. Uh, we want to make sure that there is a smooth transition uh, to ensure that the projects that we're working on, you know, continue. This is all a work in progress. It's, it's your life's work, and then it's turned, out, turned over to somebody else uh, to do. But there's plenty of, of great candidates uh, that, would, that would make uh, effective representation. Is there any place where you would endorse someone? I don't know. I'll see that in what happens in time, but uh, that's a possibility. <laughs> yeah, I would file a notice of uh, resignation, a notice to vacate. Uh, from which the governor would have 10 days to schedule a special election. Uh, that could be done within 70 to 90 days of a resignation. So commercially, you would wish to accomplish things like this, right? Is there anything you regret not being able to accomplish? Yeah, the central terminal was a disappointment uh, because that was the pro one of the projects that fit into this idea of being audacious about what is possible, we just took the, we took the easy route out. And that's a shame because, you know, we see from our work, you know, at the waterfront, Niagara Street, car sharing Main Street, uh, Ohio Street, um, when you make 
infrastructure investments, private investment follows. So for every dollar that we spent in rebuilding Ohio Street, $7 in private sector investment was uh, followed. And that's not coincidental. That is a cause and effect relationship. So I just thought that you know the central terminal becoming the train station, because that was the historic <laughs> train station, would have uh, been a catalyst for the redevelopment of the Broadway Fillmore area. That's occurring now. People are very dedicated to that, that, uh, that process of restoring that building. But when you go to Washington, you see you know, Union Station. You see what the Central Terminal could have been and was. And that's disappointing. So I think that was an outlier. Um, you know, we were pretty successful in trying to get people to get behind good projects. And let me just thank, you know, in addition to my staff that's here, who are extraordinary individually and collectively, uh, the Buffalo media. You know, a lot of these issues, when you take on, like, the New York Power Authority, they just want you to go away. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're a congressman or a senator or a mayor or whatever it is. The key is not to go away. But that requires that the local mo media help you to, to sustain that pressure. Uh, the NFTA held the waterfront property for decades and wouldn't give it up. They said they wanted money for it. They should have been sued for negligence. But that held Buffalo back for a long time. But it took 20 years to get them to relinquish control of, of the waterfront area. So what we've tried to do is, you know, I, I don't really chase the 24-hour news cycle in Washington. A lot of people do that, they're good people, and that's their business. Buffalo needed a different congressman. And what we tried to do, and that's fleeting anyhow, it just lasts until the news cycle ends and then it starts again. And when you do a retrospective about what's been accomplished, typically the conclusion is very little. What we tried to do here is identify what's important, find a focus, sustain a focus, and produce an outcome. Have vision, but being prepared to make that vision something real. And there are many examples of it, and we're proud of that work, but it simply provides a basis from which the next generation can build on, on those uh, successes if they deem them to be so. What advice would you offer to whoever ends up going to that you wish somebody had given to you before you sat? Well, just exactly what I had, you know, there's, there's, there's show horses in Congress and there are work horses. I just gravitate to the workhorses. I was on the House, I'm on the House Ways and Means Committee. Eight presidents, eight vice presidents, 23 speakers of the House, and four members of the United States Supreme Court came from, including William McKinley, uh, who was shot here at the Pan-American Exposition, came from the House Ways and Means Committee. It is a serious committee with serious minds. It has become very politicized. And when I say that, you know, legislation has become weaponized. You know, speakers of the House of both parties would say to a member, that's a stupid piece of legislation. That doesn't do anything. It's never going to get signed into law. You're making a mockery of the institution, right? It doesn't happen anymore. So now you're in Washington for longer periods of time doing less. And as Moody's reported last week, the downgrading of American debt from stable to negative is a direct result of the dysfunction uh, in Congress. So what I would say is, you know, be Buffalo's congressman. Don't, don't get immersed in that culture there. It's just not healthy. Books have been written on it for centuries about all of that stuff. The reason Article I of the United States Constitution deals with Congress is because it's the most important of the three branches, as I said. And the most important branch of Congress is the House. Why? They're closest to the people. So when I used to go to Washington, right after votes were done, I'd get on the first plane to get back to Buffalo because it was an urgent reminder as to why I was sent there in the first place. And I would advise anybody, whether you're from Buffalo or Boston, go down there and represent your community, and you won't have time for all the other nonsense. 
you know, 15 rounds of votes to elect a speaker. You elect a speaker so that they can be a leader, whether you agree with them or not, and then you ignore the speaker and throw them out. I mean, it's just, it's just kind of stuff that is just wearing on the American people, but it's hurting, you know, the, the federal budget is nearly $7 trillion. That's 24% of the world's economy, 24%. We are just downgraded by movies because of political dysfunction. I mean, let's have a fight. Let's at least earn, you know, our, our stripes here. But, but to default and not to take yourself and your community, the, the nearly 800,000 people that elect you more seriously, you just go down there to be a wise guy. Everything's weaponized. Everybody, friend enemy distinctions. Everybody's ze everything's zero sum. For somebody to win, somebody has to lose. That is not the tradition of this country. Gratitude. It'll change. You know, we're a resilient country. Um, there are good Republicans that love this country as much as I do. I deal with them every day. It's not everybody, and there are good Democrats that love this country as much as Republicans. That is the American political uh, tradition. Um, I will always be a, a grateful and humble student uh, of government. And, you know, particularly the, the Robert Caro series on Lyndon Johnson, the kinds of things that people went through to get things done was incredible. But there's a practical, there's a, in the book, Tip O'Neill, the famous House Speaker, he, there's, a, there's a piece in the book where he buttonholes Ed Markey, who was in the House at the time, now in the Senate, he's a friend of mine, and he says, hey, uh, Eddie, Eddie Markey, I need your vote on this amendment. Eddie Markey turns to Tip O'Neill and says, uh, I can't be with you on this. I'll be with you when you're right. He says, Eddie, I don't need your vote when I'm right. But it's, it's just, you know, and, and you look at the stuff that, that Johnson did just by, you know, getting Charlie Halleck uh, to, to support uh, a bill essentially for uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the, the kinds of things that they resort to and, you know, even like in the Lincoln movie, you know, like art, everything in a movie is there for a purpose. And there was that one sequence where Lincoln was going through the list and, of people that he was looking to get support the legislation. And he said, this one wants a bridge, this one wants a, and he's kind of laughing about it because he had a sense of humor uh, despite living in a horrible time. And there's a human nature aspect to this job that is, is very, very important. So I just think it's, it's time for somebody else to try. And I think new energy, uh, a new sense of purpose um, will be good for Buffalo and Western New York. Brian, some, would, some people might question the current system. Why is February, why not the July term to set in motion a yeah. political society, you know, that uh, needs to curb the party, party relationship? Why February? Because this, this situation got really bad in January. And it gets worse moving forward. And you've watched it play out, you know, the whole issue of the speaker thing, changing the rules, um, the performative nature, you know, somebody's in the back of the House chamber yelling expletives while the President of the United States is delivering the State of the Union address where 40 mi million people are watching. That individual is not one of 435 that is caring about their constituency. They just want to get on television so that they can fundraise. And it's really come down to that. You're seeing a lot of members have announced that they're leaving. Uh, and I think that that will, <coughs> that will continue. So it's something that's been on my mind for a while. And uh, so I, I just think the timing's right. How difficult is it <coughs> for me? Yeah. Well, look, I have extraordinary people that work with me. You know, I have among the best staffs in Congress. Uh, locally and in Washington. And, you know, the average tenure of a, of a congressional staffer is three years. And in our office, it's 10 years. There's a reason for that. 
you know, they're talented people that have contributed mightily to everything that we've accomplished here. You know, when we went after the Power Authority, we had to know more about the Power Authority than the Power Authority knew about itself. And we did. And that's how we beat them. At a bad game, and you catch them and, you know, conflicting statements about their operation. You know, and the Power Authority is so important because there are 16 power generating plants in New York State. Most of them either lose money or are marginally profitable. There's only two that make money. It's an agri-power project. Why is it there? You can't just locate it anywhere. It's there because we have a lake that feeds a river whose water is diverted that produces the cleanest, cheapest electricity in New York State. In 1957, an act of Congress, the Niagara Redevelopment Act, took all that power you once had to be here to use and outsourced it throughout New York State and to seven states outside of New York. So the ability as a teacher, dealing with that period of the city's history, I was a freshman in the minority, we went after them, and you know, we wanted a billion dollar settlement, which was really nothing compared to what we deserved. We settled for 300 million, but uh, it wasn't nearly enough. But how difficult was it to convince these people to walk away at this point? It, I mean, you know, you, you, you deliberate and you, and you, uh, you know, you question, you know, your vision for your own presence and what it is you're going to do. And I just hate leaving the community that I've served for 19 years. And I would just rather be in Buffalo than Washington. You know, I had a friend, <laughs> very good friend, among several inquiries, said, uh, you, know, you stay here, you're gonna really be able to cash in. <laughs> you don't get the point. <laughs> I don't wanna be in Washington. It's too transactional. Uh, and people will tell you that. You know, people that have written books, memoirs, on their time in Washington as members of Congress. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's temporary. This is home. This is a great, great city. And whatever I can do to, uh, to build it and to make it better than what it is, th that's what I want to do. I love this city. And I want everybody else to love it as much. And I think a lot of people do. But you know, the, the amazing thing is when you live somewhere, you have a tendency to take for granted those things that are unique to the place that you love. Only when you travel, and that's why travel is important, gives you perspective. You can do comparative analysis. You can see the way people, just think about this for a moment. Reader's Digest, which I didn't even know was a thing anymore, about a month ago comes out calling Buffalo the kindest city in the nation based on a vote of their editorial board. It was more than nice. Nice is one easy way to describe it. It's genuine. It's good people. It's, you know, generations of families and friends. It's beautiful natural resources. Yeah, we have a little snow, but that toughens us and we become resilient. So I guess it's, you, it's a conclusion that is drawn as you evolve and you experience certain things. But this year has been a particularly bad year for the country, for the country. And, you know, I'm not really about wasting time. And, I will tell you, over the last six weeks, most of our time in Washington has been sitting around waiting for House Republicans to fix their situation. And then, you know, again, the other night, 25 resolutions to cut the pay of the Secretary of Homeland Security. That's never gonna become law. It's just a wise guy that wants to make a point and have a talking point to their local community. There are more important things in life than that right now. And as I said, it will get better. Things ebb and flow. But I think that we're at the beginning of a bad trend, not the end of one. What do you think are some of the biggest issues impacting your district that you know, the city council is going to need to tackle? Well, I think that you know a lot of people, I mentioned before optimistically, that you know, Buffalo is going through somewhat of a renaissance, but not all of Buffalo. And we saw from the May 14th shooting and the pandemic, the fragility of inequality 
had manifested itself. And we have to do something about that. When you look at the cancer space, I'm a co-chair of the Cancer Caucus. We have played a major role in pushing the administration to increase the funding to the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute. But you look at 6% of those who should be screened for lung cancer in industrial areas um, are not screened. And Roswell, to their considerable credit, had the presence of mind to establish a mobile unit to go to the people. And <clears throat> detecting cancer early is important for survival. Less than 10% of cancer deaths are attributed to the original tumor. It's when cancer advances, when it metastasizes, when it, when, it, when, it, when it moves to an organ that you can't live without. You know, people don't die of breast cancer. People die of metastatic breast cancer to the brain. But cancer deaths are counted by their origin. So that's why we talk about breast cancer the way that we do. And that's why being diagnosed at stage one is a lot better than being diagnosed at stage four. Uh, because the survival rate is higher. Therefore, um, early detection and screening uh, is very, very important. Lifestyle, um, smoking. More men will die of cancer than women. Why? Because men smoke more. Twelve specific cancers are attributed to tobacco use, smoking. Ninety percent of lung cancers are attributed to smoking, you know. So I think it's about trying to find a more equitable, inclusive uh, way to grow Buffalo and Western New York. To have a renaissance, everybody has to participate. Everybody has to feel seen and heard. And I think uh, that's important uh, to Buffalo. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody.